Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week, you'll hear two segments. First up, a chat with California-based activist Victoria from Merced Under Construction, who talks to us about prisoner hunger strikes at the Merced County Jail and the John Lataroca Center. Over 40 prisoners engaged in a hunger strike for 17 days, fighting for issues like protesting black mold, little food, lack of visitation, and other issues. The hunger strike ended on Saturday, March 28th, despite the disrespect of jail administration breaking the agreement with the prisoners. You can learn more about how to support and keep up on the struggles there by visiting linktr.ee slash Merced under construction. Then you'll hear from Josh from the Certain Days Calendar and Mookie from the Civil Liberties Defense Center who do an update and roundup of the recent trial of Eric King. Eric King was found innocent on charges of assaulting a Federal Bureau of Prisons lieutenant, a charge that would have added another 20 years to his time in prison. More on his case at supportericking.org, more on certain days at certaindays.org, and the CLDC can be found at cldc.org. If you're listening to the radio version, you can hear more in the full edition up online, plus Sean Swain's segment at our website. So could you please introduce yourself with whatever name, pronouns, location, or like affiliation, anything that the audience would uh, sort of be helpful to the audience so that they could place you for this conversation? All right, great. Uh, My name is Victoria Spinoza, and I identify as a child of God. Um, I'm born and raised in Merced, California, and I'm the founder of Merced Under Construction. And could you tell us a bit about where Merced County is, uh, what listeners should know about the county, the economy, who lives there, what it looks like, you know, that sort of stuff? Oh, well, Merced, oh man, not a lot of people know where Merced is. When they hear Central Valley, they're like, what is that? (laughs) (laughs) They think of like Bay Area, LA, when you think of California. Um, But we are... Um, literally like central of the, the state of California, like the Central Valley area in between Fresno and Modesto um, or Stanislaus and Fresno counties. Merced is <laughs> our city slogan. It's a gateway to Yosemite. And, you know, we we boast about it or the city does at least. But nearly 25 percent of our population is living in poverty. Um, So it's like predominantly white, Latino, like Hispanic, Mexican, indigenous folks living here with some other races mixed in. So we have like less than 4% black folks. Uh, We do have a very strong Hmong community here um, and a lot of other different, you know, different nationalities, races that are here. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. And for like, as far as the, um, you, you mentioned like 25% of the population living in poverty, what are the sort of industries that people are involved in? Is it agriculture? I'm, I'm sure a lot of, since we're going to be talking about prisons, I'm sure that like prisons and police and military are like big employers for parts of the population. Yeah. So we are a very large agriculture community. So we do have a lot of um, farm workers. We have a lot in many of our city, cities and our outskirts as well and unincorporated areas. So that is one one thing that we do have strong here in Merced is the ag. Um, you know, we have some industry, industrial stuff, um, but mainly like we're known for agriculture, honestly. Uh, we do have UC Merced. I was the last university that's been built. And I mean, they're building on that. Um, UC Merced is growing obviously so we are seeing some of that some some things that are happening um in our community with uh rent controls not happening um, people are getting pushed out and it's just it's it's not it's not the merced that it used to be 10 years ago definitely i guess i do want to ask some questions about merced under construction later and imagine that that's like gentrification and like uh causes like that or, or issues like that are being engaged with that group is that right yes I guess like jumping off into the main topic though. Uh, so we're, we're speaking because there's been hunger strikes among incarcerated folks at the jails um, in the County. Can you talk a bit about the conditions at Merced County jail and also at the John Lataroca 
or Lateraka, excuse me. And John Lateraka, you said it okay. right, um, but we, it has a nickname called Sandy Mush. I don't even okay. know where the nickname comes from, but <laughs> that's its nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what's um what's been up with the hunger strike? Can you talk a little bit about like what sparked it and how many folks are participating? Just sort of like the basic stuff on that. Yeah, so the last count that we had, it was about forty four initially, but since then we've had people probably come out and people probably go in. So I haven't got an accurate count as to how many that could be. You know, from the initial start of the strike um, yesterday, marked day seventeen. I haven't heard from anybody since noontime yesterday so i'm hoping privileges weren't were not taken but they're they were dealing with a ton of ton of stuff going on black mold in the housing units and that's impacting health not being given hot meals even hot water you know just simple basic human asks you know just necessities to live on you know the the grievances for these things that there were issues administration they were being ignored or they're getting vague responses you know that whole system had failed losing mail incoming outgoing was already a problem before the pandemic and since the pandemic had started it became even worse and since they had their visitations taken for o- over 2 years with the excuse of the pandemic and weren't offered any other means like the mail and the phones became a vital lifeline and those were basically stolen from them and that has impacted them in negative ways i mean their mental health inability to make appropriate decisions like so many people that were in the facility the past 2 plus years uh, we're taking deals just to get out of the jails here so they could go to a prison that offers visitation. And that is crazy. That, I mean, that's like people at their last, at yeah. their at their wits end. Like, I'm going to take a deal just so I can get out of here because this is like living hell. So, I mean, that was a, a serious thing. Being discriminated against based on their housing status, you know, the jail uniforms, that impacts them when they're before a judge, the district attorney. And these are a lot of these same asks for things that we saw from the 2016 prison strikes that Merced County county jails were also a part of and it's nearly six years later and not much has changed and it's just kind of kind of crazy you know they were on day 17 as of yesterday and they were in negotiation so the the agreement was actually yesterday for them to end their strike and they were supposed to end it with a hot breakfast have their hot water but then the morning came and we ran into issues with the staff began to be they began to be hostile towards them and when meals came around they didn't bring them anything they didn't even bring them cold food they didn't bring them anything they did not bring them hot water um they were just being cold and just like I, when i when i think about it, it was just evil like towards mm-hmm. them so it was just like they basically went through all these negotiations for what purpose like the they were with the sheriff's corrections they had agreed for, they had agreed to this for, on day 17 that it would break in the morning on these conditions and th- those two basic conditions weren't even met so i mean they weren't they weren't accepting any meals from the admin um, they weren't doing any movements at all so that I mean their yard time they're what they're getting maybe two or three hours a week if that um, anyway, um, they weren't accepting court movements. They weren't even seeing their attorneys for meetings. They basically weren't doing anything, any medical, anything like that. They were basically saying, I'm not moving. I'm not eating until you guys change some stuff. And the negotiations, I don't know, after noontime yesterday, they said that they had pulled some folks out. We were doing some phone zaps for them on their behalf yesterday, uh, all the jail facilities and the Board of Supervisors, and they did pull some of them out to have more talks. But after that, it's been radio silent. So I'm, I'm hoping everything's going okay. That sounds like a terrible just flex, uh, kind of authoritarian flex that places like jails and, and the kind of people that staff them would make. When, when you're mentioning like people taking deals just so they can go to prison, so just for the audience, uh, are a lot of the people that are there and who are participating in this in pretrial conditions right now and just sort of awaiting their day in court or are Correct. there... Okay, and also people who have gotten county charges who are being held there too? Yeah, we do have some people that serve sentences here locally. I think if it's under two years, one year, just to, it's at the discretion of our county facility if they want to house somebody for their time or if they're going to send them to state prison, they have that ability. So, but w- uh, most of the folks that are here are pretrial detainees. So they haven't yet been convicted of a crime. Um, some of these are not, um, you know, site and release offenses, you know, with the whole bail reform law. And some of these people are sitting in there 
on bellable offenses, but yet they don't have the funds to make that happen. It's so so inhumane that you expect someone to be able to put their life on hold and also not be able to necessarily access the means to build a defense for themselves because they're worrying about how their family's doing on the outside and they're just kind of waiting until the courts have enough time to to see them. You had mentioned the uniforms too. And I know that in the demands, there was a statement about how, you know, like the uniforms that were being assigned to people weren't necessarily respective to like security threat group status that people were in. And, and I know that that even the, I guess, TG type thing, saying that someone's in a gang or whatever, isn't always applied, like, according to someone's actual participation in a criminal organization. But can you say a little bit about people's experience of the of the issue of the uniforms and what that means for access to programs or to things like uh, like ability to research in the library? It, oh, not that there probably is a library, but you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, I think a lot of it, the people that are more impacted by this whole uniform thing are predominantly brown, Latino, Hispanic, Mexican, indigenous individuals. Um, because they separate them by the two gang classifications, Norteños and Sureños. Um, pretty much everybody else gets housed as general population when it comes to the maximum security facility of the Mercer County Jail. Um, but mainly these folks are, you know, the Southern, Northern, or the red and the blue, however the classification deems it. Um, they separate them. And since Merced County unfortunately operates on LA County's informal gang injunction model, a lot of people come into our jails, are impacted and being labeled gang members based on familial association, based on where they live. They might live next to somebody that's a documented or validated gang member. And so they get housed in, they say it's for their safety to house them this way, right? But then we have people that are not from any of these origins um, being classified like this. And so when they go to court and you see the Northern Norteño, um, classifications they're in green and white stripes the southern are in a blue and white stripe and so that takes a big um, toll on them when they're going through the whole process you know how the district attorney is looking at them how the judges are looking at them and the bias that comes with that and this has been going on for a long time um, with this facility and we know that other jails like in Stanislaus County they have a different system and basically people are housed as general population just like they do in prisons everybody's pretty much housed just together and they know how to separate folks. So that's where the sheriff's corrections here in Merced were talking about introducing a bracelet system, but they've talked about this before back in 2016 and no changes have been made. Um, so that's, that's a problem <laughs> for a lot of people, especially when they're going through uh, this whole unfortunate situation um, with being incarcerated, being labeled as a quote unquote gang member, um, even if they've never even been a part of that lifestyle. And it's pretty disgusting that yeah. this has been going on for so many decades. This has been happening for a long time in this community. And do you have like a sense of, I mean, are they just going to keep going as long as they can go with it? So right now, so what they were doing, they were refusing all admin meals and basically attempting to survive minimally off what they could get on commissary. And commissary is trash. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's a lot of things that are not even acceptable for the human body. And, you know, these are things that people are forced to buy because they're not getting proper nutrition from the food that they're getting from the facility itself. And the food that, they, you know, they were protesting. Part of the strike was protesting the inadequate conditions of the food and improper nutrition. I mean, people's health being impacted, like they've been in there for a few months and we got folks losing teeth. I mean, that that's how bad it is. Um, so it, that was pretty much what they were doing, um, if refusing all admin meals. And because they weren't even getting hot meals um, like they should have been, at least two hot meals a day, it's the minimum. Um, they weren't getting that for uh, so long. And yeah, that's pretty much what they were refusing. And it, it was affecting a lot of them. I mean, yesterday was day 17. And so they were in the negotiations ready to say, all right, well, yeah. we'll accept if we get a hot meal. Like it's been a long time since we've had a hot meal. I can't imagine going 17 days without yeah. a hot meal. <laughs> or even hot water. I mean, that's just like the basic things that you need, right? And that was the other thing is the hot water, being able to have hot water. So there's the cruelty of not offering these things 
so you, you mentioned that administration like had made the agreement that after 17 days, they would offer them a warm meal and hot water. And they refused that. Like, how have they been expressing themselves and their reasoning for continuing to treat people in this manner in the media? Because I'm sure that they've been making statements the media has been reproducing, right? Yeah, well, initially, the Merced Sunstar had wrote an article Again, without interviewing any detainees or inmates and without reaching out and speaking to any of the loved ones or anybody that was involved in the organizing around the strike out here. And they interviewed the sheriff's department. And, you know, basically they were just talking about how they're supposedly meeting um, meeting and in negotiations, you know, these asks of the detainees and the inmates which was not true. I mean, at that point, so we had, you know, sent out a media advisory challenging him to show us, to tell us exactly what's being done um, because the public has a right to know um, public, I mean, public state funds or whatever is being used to fund that facility and all the things that are happening in there. So, I mean, you know, they're going to paint their own narrative. That's, that's basically what they're going to do. And they're going to do that time and time again. I don't think that's going to change, but when they were in negotiations and, you know, they, they had, they had clearly stated, okay, we will break our strike on day 17 when we get our hot breakfast and our hot water. And, you know, about, you know, five, six o'clock when they're usually taking out the trays came around, um, Nothing came, not even cold food. And then when they were trying to communicate with the correctional staff, they were being treated hostily and they were basically taunting them saying, yeah, your hot water's out here, but Mm. we're not going to bring it to you. Well, how are they going to go and get it? How are they going to go and get that water? It's out there, but we're not bringing it to you. I mean, those type that, that type of behavior, it's just, it's unnecessary And so, yeah, you're right. It was just kind of like that flex. Well, you know, we can pretty much continue to do what we want kind of thing. And they felt helpless. Yeah, they they were reaching out to us. So we started, um, we we, we had put out posts and numbers for phone zap, you know, to try to get something. And then after a couple of hours, they pulled some folks out um, to have more communications with them. But that was around noontime yesterday. And like, again, like I said, we haven't heard anything from inside as of it. So, yeah, as far as like the public needing to know about this, and you mentioned the taxpayer money and such, but also all the people that are in there, almost everyone is going to have people on the outside who care about them. And that's, I'm sure, a lot of the people that like, not just people who have an idea that this is a wrong circumstance, but they have a personal care for loved ones that are stuck behind these bars. How has the outside engagement been in terms of, as far as you could tell, in terms of like organizing, communicating, offering support to loved ones, participating in the phone zaps or or showing up in person? Oh, I mean, I mean, for instance, the rally that we had on the 21st, the tone, the turnout was low. I mean, we had less than 12, we had like 12 people total and a lot of that right now has the fact it has to do with the inmates and the loved ones their concern with the possibility of retaliation and also the risk of even advocating for somebody out here that's in there or whatnot people that are quote-unquote labeled as gang members you run the risk of being labeled a gang member yourself i mean and that that's a consequence that many folks that are impacted face I mean, I might even be labeled as a gang member because according to a loved one that I had that was inside the facility just recently, the end of last year, they were taken out by classifications and asked questions about myself, about, quote unquote, we know she's a gang member. Who does she run with? And these type of things. And I know that this facility has blocked my phone number so that folks in there cannot no longer reach out to me. And that's unfortunate. Um, Because we've had, I didn't know about the hunger strike actually until day 10 that I had somebody from the family members in there had to find me and search for me in order to make the connection because I, and I didn't know my, my number had been blocked from the facility itself. So, I mean, that's another thing, you know, folks trying to organize in there, trying to reach out for help. And they're literally blocking their means of a lifeline um, from within the Merced County jails for whatever reason. I don't, I don't know why, but you know, that that's pretty much what we're seeing. And there are people in there that don't have anyone. So we have people in there reaching out 
because they need they need funds like they don't have any any funds for personal care or to get anything from the commissary line. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it becomes a community within the facility when you have people like that that are indigenous and they they should be able to utilize the welfare funds. And then when they utilize the welfare funds, when they do get commissary on their book, then all of a sudden the staff comes and takes that for any time they went to the doctor, any time they got a, a mail package for the one month, you know, where there's four or five dollars if they've been in there for a year, then somebody puts 50, 100 dollars on their books. And all of a sudden administration comes and says, oh, you owe us this money. And then they snatch it. So that's kind of a problem as well for those people that are impacted in that way. They don't have loved ones out here at all. So, I mean, if, if the administration takes the tack of separating people according to ostensible like gang certifications or whatever, putting them in these different uniforms. Have people been able to, despite that, organize across these lines with each other for the hunger strike and the common understanding that we're all suffering under this? Yeah, I uh, I seen that this time around as well, that people were joining in solidarity within the facility itself. But yet it's just very hard, you know, to try to make those connections Inside the facility, I mean, because the Merced County Jail, it's the maximum security facility. So it's pretty, se- it's heavily segregated. But, you know, people were still in solidarity with that, you know, trying to say, hey, like, we have these same issues. Like, let's join together. Let's band together. So that was one thing that they were doing in there. Yeah, that's awesome. To try to show them, hey, we don't have to be segregated. We don't have to be labeled like this. And we don't mm-hmm. have to wear different uniforms. We could be housed together. We can even organize together <laughs> inside of the facility for change is anyone on the outside raising the alarm that i mean obviously like black mold is a health issue that that is on the books that black mold can cause mental issues it can cause lung issues quite obviously and you know not getting your caloric value like or like your intake of calories every day will cause can also cause mental anguish as well as a decrease in starvation basically have there been anyone successfully being able to raise concerns about the demands of of the folks inside of these two jails from a legal standpoint saying this doesn't follow the california requirements for how a county jail operates has that been a direction that's been helpful at all we uh, we haven't had any support in that area and i mean i've reached out and it just seems like um, there are not, I mean, even I've reached out to ACLU, I've reached out to other firms for prisoner rights. And a lot of these places, they're not based near our area. And so they just say, we don't have anybody that can cover or we're at our capacity. So we haven't seen any relief in that way. But I'm going to hopefully be getting together with some folks in the next week to draft something up because we want to have an external review and investigation because I don't think our grand, our Merced County grand jury is doing a good enough job because they've seen these conditions for a number of years and they haven't enforced any type of action to make them correct it on a permanent, you know, status. So we're going to have to look to like OGI or OIG, whatever the, that uh, external government entity that's over our prisons and our jails is going to have to come and put eyes on this. Let me see. So could you talk a little bit about Mira and about Merced under construction? Like who's getting involved and, and what the groups are about and uh, talk about the difficulties or, or any, any difficulties or wins that you've seen with those groups? Oh, awesome. Um, so Mira is actually, it stands for Merced Inmate Rights Association. And it is... Um, the page that's ran by the loved ones of the current detainees and inmates of the Mercer County jails and the John Lauderaca jail is pretty awesome. And they're, they're, they're new to all of this stuff, but you know, they're so passionate and driven to like, you know, bring awareness. And that's kind of where I fit in. I've been a directly impacted person, right? It's kind of how uh, Mercer under construction all came to- together and right now, um, we're just looking for support. I mean, because we're I'm not Merced Under Construction isn't officially an org or anything like that. And I'm actually we're opposed <laughs> to the whole nonprofit industrial complex. So we're really looking to folks, you know, keep it like really grassroots and centered around real people and being able to find funding for like the work and whatnot. And Hopefully we can start doing that here pretty soon. But that's basically what we're doing. We're just 
were just centered around um, incarceration and uh, the impacts of that on people and their families, a lot of work around police accountability and create, creating opportunities for formerly incarcerated folks and their families, you know, and that, that one of the pillars is, you know, definitely to reach out to the children that are impacted by it as well. Can you talk a little bit about the name Merced Under Construction? Like, is that about, does it concern just like that the community is not complete, it's not done, we're like, we're still building it as we go? Or is it more of a like, there's money coming in for development projects, we need to make sure that those developments are actually uh, supporting the people that already live here as opposed to larger entities? Um, It's a little bit of both. <laughs> and the fact that we're just never done. Uh, there's so much work to be done. And when, uh, we, you know, when we have developers and we have, you know, businesses looking at Merced to build and we have more and more funding going into suppression and first responding in our community. And yet we still have youth that are being impacted, um, joblessness, home, uh, homelessness, houselessness, and people that are struggling, trying to stretch a food stamp, um, people that are just falling through the cracks. And I, I just feel like it's always it's always going to be undone until we can finally like bring that awareness and, you know, bring folks together, have this accountability and figure out where the money is going, <laughs> because some of the some of these funds that they're they're getting like the COVID-19 funding and all the extra grants and stuff that they get for every arrest that they can deem a gang related arrest or an incarceration they can deem gang related they're getting federal and state fund grants on top of that so is that is that a reason so i know merce is just always under construction yeah kind of like a, a side note uh i did cop watch when i was living in sonoma county and we were noticing this is like in 2000 like the mid 2000s mm -hmm. uh and we were seeing that the local gang task force, which was made up to some degree, like it did have CHP um, participation, but also it was mostly the county that was coordinating it with local police departments. And they would all kind of join together to do under the auspices of gang issues. They would set up checkpoints and they would also get DUI, like federal anti-DUI funding to set up checkpoints in immigrant neighborhoods where people maybe didn't have the papers for the car that they were driving because they were sharing it among multiple families or uh, maybe they didn't have a license because they weren't legally allowed to because they were undocumented uh, and, and just like getting the money to go and set up there under the auspices of gangs or DUIs nowhere near a bar and taking people's vehicles who were absolutely being marginalized by capitalism and, and white supremacy uh, and, f and selling those and funding their own department out of that. That sounds kind of like it's par for the course for California's uh, uh, <laughs> like policing systems. Yeah. And uh, there, I mean, there's so, there's so many, there's the minor decoy program grants that they get. There's just so many little things and it's all fruit of the poisonous tree uh, in my opinion. And it doesn't really, impact anything like we're seeing like you, the, what you're talking about the duis and the minor yeah. decoy we're talking about the minor decoy like these little these little grants and they get a ton of money but yet in my community violent crime is up murder is up rapes are up child murder we just had a little girl that was killed in our community her body was found her, her mm. nine years old sophia mason beautiful black child these type of crimes are happening but they're putting money into checkpoints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're putting money into seeing if anybody's going to buy a minor alcohol or cigarettes. But we have, we have some dark, unnecessary crime rising here. And it's just like, my mind is blown. Home invasions are up. Just, it's just crazy. And we're a very small community compared on the scale of, you know, the state of California. Merced County is tiny. <laughs> we're very small. Um, so it, it, again, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all whatsoever. Well, how can listeners find out more about the strike and support it from where they're at? Um, maybe not locally or if, or locally, if you have some suggestions. Oh, definitely. Awesome. Um, so we'll be, we'll continue posting meetup page, the Merced Inmate Rights Association page, the Merced Under Construction 
Instagram and Facebook page. But like I said, we're unofficial org. So we're asking folks to support. Um, right now we have link tree link up. And I mean, if folks, you know, have it in their heart and their conscience to, you know, support us, uh, we'll be accepting donations through buy me a coffee through that outlet. But we're, we're putting funds together for detainees and inmates directly. So we want to be able to put, you know, fund, I mean, several people, at least a month commissary account, whether that's $25, whether that's $50, we want to be able to put, you know, money for them to use themselves for the phone, for food, for personal care, et cetera. Um, we're also want to be having some letter writing days where we'll be sending them out like handwritten letters, cards, um, communication with folks that are inside of the facilities themselves. Um, so we have a direct line and there's a lot of people, like I had said before, they don't have anybody out on the outside. They don't come from much. And so we want to be able to support them and let them know that they're, they are loved, that they're cared about and that there are people out here that say that they matter. And so um, a lot of uh, the other work we're doing that we need support with, it's police accountability part of our work. And that, I mean, sometimes we have bits of a drive, you know, we have to drive, got to take reports, do our own investigations. And we also have to request records from whatever, you know, government agency that the officer um, involved works with. So, you know, we have to pay for flex or dash cam or other records. And again, we don't want to be a part of the nonprofit industrial complex. So we're trying to just keep it grassroots and just real people funding real work that's really happening in Merced. And we've never done this before. You know, it's only always been on our own time on our own dime. And now we're like really needing assistance because it's growing. So that's basically just check us out on Facebook, um, Instagram, and hopefully we can get our, our website up here in like the next month or so. That's awesome. Victoria, thank you so much for having this conversation for the work that you're doing. Yeah, I guess keep in touch and uh, we'll, we'll keep trying to cover this when we can. I appreciate you, Bruce. Thank you so much. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Kite Line is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand to hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on Kite Line, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. Hi, would you please introduce yourselves for the audience with any names, pronouns, affiliations, and, and how you relate to Eric King? Sure. My name's Josh. I'm based out of Baltimore, and I do a lot of political prisoner support work and abolition work. Uh, I'm a member of the Certain Days Calendar Collective and the Children's Art Project with political prisoner Oso Blanco. I'm currently also editing a book with Eric King, where we interview political prisoners about their lives inside. And I work in communications with the Zen Education Project. And um, I guess I first started writing Eric in 2017 or so, and we've been corresponding ever since. My name is uh, Mookie Moss, and I, my pronouns are he and him. I've been on the CLDC board of directors for, oh gosh, maybe six or seven years. My day job has been a farmer for the last 25 or 26 years, but I've worked in and around a lot of radical organizations, uh, both in the United States and in South America. And a lot of the work that I've done has been around, you know, indigenous farmers down south and uh, anti-capitalist movements in South America and here in the United States, environmental activists, that kind of stuff. So that's who I am. So for listeners who don't know Eric, can you say some words about who he is and, and what he was convicted of? To be totally frank and honest, I have come to Eric King's case pretty late in the game, but I did I did jump in with both feet based on this opportunity to work with the organization that I work with, which is the Civil Liberties Defense Center. My learning of Eric's life and his story has was kind of a crash course, but just based on my past experience being there for his trial, he came across to me as a incredibly emotionally sensitive guy and also a really intelligent guy. He spoke really, really well. He obviously, because he's a political prisoner, I think my, my view is, is that he really looks at his experience uh, 
both in jail and the world around him through a very, very strong political lens. So I would just add that. Cool. Yeah. And with the, um, with the usage of the term political prisoner in there, yeah, that, that says a lot, not only for what he was convicted for, right, for that politically motivated property destruction, but also for the way that he's conducted himself and also about how he's been treated by administrations since he's been inside. Can you all talk a bit about, as sort of background for this case, what has Eric's treatment been like in prison? How is he related to other prisoners as an anti-fascist and as an uh, anti-authoritarian? And also how the staff has related to him for these reasons? Sure. So Eric currently has been in solitary confinement for over a thousand days, over three years. He's been in federal prisons all over the country, uh, in private prisons as well, and he's been brutalized and attacked wherever he's been sent, uh, either by guards or by Nazi-type prisoners. He's defended himself every step of the way, and he's tried to help other prisoners, I think, whenever he's been given the chance to, uh, to help voice their concerns. And I think it's also important to point out that it's not just Eric being targeted, that this happens to political prisoners and prisoners in general throughout history. It's currently happening not only with Eric King, but as you know, with Sean Swain having his finger chopped off, uh, you know, recently by guards. There are several indigenous prisoners being abused now for the religious reasons, having their sweat lodge destroyed in a federal prison in California. I mean, it goes back all the way, you know, the Attica brothers, Herman Bell being abused years ago before he got out a few years ago. You know, it goes back throughout American history of guard abuse. It's, it's pretty endless. I would also add just to what Josh eloquently put is that witnessing what Eric actually just went through um, as an extenuation of that type of torture and bullshit and experience that he has dealt with all along the way watching how the Bureau of Prisons handled him during, even just during this court case where there was obviously a spotlight put, a, put upon him and put upon his conditions and experience was mind boggling to watch and to, wit, to bear witness to. I, I have been interested in political prisoners and, and the struggle for a very, very long time. And so I, it's not like I came into this with a blind eye, like people are being treated well in prison, but the amount of punitive and destructive behavior from the Bureau of Prisons towards Eric just during this case, there was something coming up and I can talk about that and Josh and I can talk about that, but it was, it was just, it was a microcosm of a much larger experience of let's turn the screws against the people that are standing up for, for themselves and for their, their, their belief systems. So it was really something else. You know, speaking of screws, would you all mind talking a little bit about what this trial was about and what what sort of outcomes Eric was facing during it and how long it's lasted? Because it seems like it's lasted a very long time to get to the to the phase of actually going before a judge and jury. Yeah, that's right. So if I'm getting my dates right, the original the original incident which caused this this recent trial took place uh, August seventeenth, two thousand and eighteen. And it was a, it was a situation where a assault had happened in the institution that Eric was spending time in, and Eric wrote a email to his wife to sort of blow off some steam and describe the situation that had happened in the institution he was spending time in. Basically, he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have the email in front of me, so I'm, I'm not going to read it word for word. But basically, he was um, describing and feeling some excitement over the fact that a prisoner had struck a correctional officer. And, you know, beyond that, he went on to describe, you know, the feeling of wishing that he could be there to witness it, wishing he could have seen it. Had could have, he, he said something along the lines of, even even watching it in virtual reality, and he was pulled out of his pulled out of his cell because that email obviously was read by the correctional authorities and, and the, the guards, and so he got pulled out of his cell under the guise that they were going to do an investigation, and so he walked himself from his cell down to a, a place called the lieutenant's office, and the lieutenant's office really was a long hallway that had four rooms that came off of that hallway. Uh, a couple of them were lieutenant's offices. One was a property room, I believe it was described at. And in the last room 
uh, in that hallway was a broom closet, a broom closet full of, you know, mop buckets, rakes, tools, you know, all these different things. What happened next changes a lot depending on which correctional authority you heard the story from. But Eric's, Eric's story never really changed a bit. What Eric's story was is he was led into this broom closet. There were two correctional guards, uh, I think two lieutenants, uh, Lieutenant Wilcox and a Lieutenant Comrade. Lieutenant Wilcox got in his face. Eric said, you know, I don't, I don't want to fight. There's two of you, essentially. Wilcox kicked out his subordinate comrade. And, you know, Wilcox started a fight with Eric. He called him a bitch. He called him a punk in this broom closet. And he attacked Eric. And Eric, in turn, decided that he didn't think that being attacked in a broom closet was going to be good for his life or good for his, his situation. And so he fought back and he struck Lieutenant Wilcox in the face three times very in very quick succession you know lieutenant wilcox was a really big guy and eric is not a big guy so it was pretty clear that eric was more skilled in that expression and he broke wilcox's nose and after he broke wilcox's nose the other guards the other lieutenants ran in and you know eric had assumed a passive or a neutral not a passive but a neutral position after he put Wil- Wilcox down on the ground, and then from there, a whole series of things unfolded. But essentially, the case was a he said, he said case, you know, where Wilcox said one thing and Eric said the truth. And fortunately for this court case, the guards that all had a story to share the story was so convoluted and, and frankly bullshit that that really came out in the trial. So this, this turned out to be a self-defense case and it's pretty remarkable. You know, the, the legal team for the CLDC, Lauren Regan, Sarah Alvarez and Sandra Freeman, they did an incredible job. Um, not only showing the inconsistencies and discrepancies in the Bureau of Prisons story, uh, but also did a really good job giving Eric an opportunity to speak his truth up on the stand. And uh, we are we are lucky enough to see, have, be in one of those very rare situations where justice prevailed. Okay, there's a few things that I heard throughout the course of the last, I guess, three and a half years, including that Wilcox had said, ooh, you're an Antifa, huh? Like something about his daughter get like running into anti-fascists and having a problem with that. He just sort of like threw out a bunch of weird disconnected shit. It sounded like, yeah, but it seemed like it must've been some sort of prefigured situation for them to take him into a room that the only room that didn't have any cameras, uh, which was a bit suspect. And then afterwards to take him to a, like hold him down in restraint for a number of hours, like 14 hours or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about some of that sure yeah he was he was held in in four point restraint for hours after the uh, after the uh, incident occurred after he was beaten yeah th- there's parts of it on video there's parts of it that were missing on video i think it's also worth mentioning i i, I listened to the trial um from afar but at one point i think they tried to make the case that a black eye that eric suffered was actually in his antifa tattoo on his face which is just another uh, way of showing that, that you know it's his politics that they're attacking, uh, which I think it does prove, go to show what you were saying that it, it it's um, you know it's intentional and it is planned out and yeah anything to add there, Mookie? Um, yeah, you know Josh is correct. They did try to try to at at one point try to pin that black eye on the fact that he had a tattoo there. Um, at another point, they were sort of edging towards this reasoning and this was very skillfully shut down by Eric's defense team but potentially that Eric either got the black eye when he was brought down on his face by the rest of the guards who rushed in to save their buddy Wilcox it was sort of hinted at one time that maybe potentially he could have given himself that black eye which is of course ridiculous because after this incident there wasn't a moment that Eric was off camera Luckily, there was a nurse at the facility that Eric was sent to after this attack took place. 
that this was the only Bureau of Prisons nurse that actually checked Eric out in any sort of realistic way and made notes that he had showed up with a pretty significant shiner. If you look at the video of the medical assessment that they did after this whole incident took place, it's, I mean, I guess this should Oh, this should shock absolutely no one who has any sort of understanding about how the Bureau of Prisons works. But the the nurse who did the initial medical assessment spent about three minutes. Eric complained of a high level of pain in his temple. Um, he had p- pain some other places, but really was like, hey, yeah, I'm I'm hurt and I'm hurting right now. And there was never a second look given to him. It was really, really something else. She inquired about a potential new tattoo, which he was like, no, this tattoo is not new. But you could tell that there was a very purposeful, I guess, obfuscation of the truth that started immediately following the incident because my perception was is that they knew that they were going to have a difficult storyline to defend. And so at every turn where a modicum or a little chunk of truth could come out, instead of asking questions and risking documented truth on Eric's behalf coming out, they just slid right past it. And so the medical assessment, even though Eric, you know, the, 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 the state or the government in this case showed a picture repeatedly of Eric immediately following the incident, but we're talking minutes after the incident. And they're like, look, he's got no black eye. This isn't true. This didn't happen because their whole case hinged on the fact that Wilcox never took a swing at Eric, never assaulted him, that Eric sucker punched Wilcox, which is just blatantly not true. But um, so, yeah, so they showed this picture of Eric right after the incident and he didn't have a shiner because as anybody knows, it takes a good chunk of time after you get hit in the eyeball to, to get a big black eye. So it was really, really, really something. Eric has had a history of, of negative interactions with authorities and with guards in the past. Uh, And if I recall, a lot of those instances were in relation to, um, private communication with his partner or poetry that he's written or drawings that he's made and then being issued as as threats by administration. And so for that, he's gotten time in solitary. He's had his rights to mail taken away. He's had uh, his ability to receive books taken away or magazines. And so just sort of uh, exacerbating and just amplifying the the academic isolation as well as personal isolation of prison that he's had to go through over these years. And usually he would just face as most prisoners, this, this kind of crap is not abnormal in the U S prison system, whether it be in a state system, in a County where someone's at jail or in the BOP where retaliation for petty things by petty guards and all being adjudicated before some sort of internal rules board or some sort of internal court. Luckily, Eric did not have to defend himself before a kangaroo court inside, you know, with without press and without defense, legal defense from other parties. How is it that this case, why is it that this case that could have tacked another 20 years onto his sentence why did this become a public case, and how did the CLDC get involved, as far as you all know? My understanding, Burst, is that this case was brought to Lauren Regan initially by uh, Daniel McGowan, correct? Yeah, I believe so. so. So Daniel, you know, Daniel, who has a longstanding relationship with the CLDC because they did defense for him back in the day when, when he was going through his trial, that he had been in contact with Eric for some time and reached out to Lauren Regan, who's the, you know, the, Eric's lead defense attorney and was the founder of the CLDC and said, Hey, there's this guy who's serving time. Who's a really, you know, he's got a really compelling story. He was, you know, he was assaulted and, and he's a, he's a really good guy. And I really believe in, believe in him and believe in, um, trying to seek some some sort of justice in this case, and Lauren, you know, Lauren has a very close friendship with Daniel, and they've got really good history together. And so I think that really bursts the reason why this happened is because there was a lot of trust, there was a lot of historic trust, and I think that that's that's a really important piece of this case is that 
you know, Lauren and I were talking about this after the trial trial wrapped up, just that it's really incredible when you see real true solidarity pay dividends like it does. Like Daniel felt solidarity with Eric and because had solidarity with, with Lauren, they came together. And Lauren was like, Daniel, if you believe in this person, I believe in you so much that let's go. And that's how it went forward. And, you know, the CLDC, this is one of the things that they specialize in is shining lights in the dark corners of the, the icky parts of our, our judicial system. And, and uh, so I think that that's, that's originally how Lauren got the case. What are the next steps in legal process for Eric? Like, is the outcome of the not guilty finding by that jury? Like, does that does that mean he's going to get any sort of reduction in his sentence? Or um, are there grounds for because they were able to prove in a public court that the claims from the administration were false and that he had been subjected to harm that are like, are there grounds for other lawsuits to sort of go back and point to the other point? portions of time when he's been stuck in solitary, been put in courtyards with giant Nazis, gotten diesel therapy, had the like not had the ability anymore to get visits from his spouse and his family. Is there anything brewing in terms of that? And or is he just scheduled for release in December 2023? And we're just hoping to get him out. Yeah, I think a lot of that is still uh, to be determined. Like like you said, he's scheduled he's scheduled to be released in a year and a half in December 2023. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that he's still locked up in there. Um, as of right now, as of the the end of March, that he's still on a mail ban. He can still only receive mail from his family. Last I heard, he's still in solitary confinement, even though he won the case. And I think that there's a likelihood that he'll probably be transferred. Who knows where that might be? Probably a lot of diesel therapy, a lot more diesel therapy. But I think it's also, again, important to keep in mind that in the face of all this violence, in the face of all this state repression, that he's he's met it with face on with, with a sense of humor, and he's been able to build strong relationships not only with people, those of us on the outside, but with those imprisoned right alongside of him. Even when he's in the worst possible conditions, he's he's organizing and he's educating and he's sharing as much as he can with those around him. I, I would also just add, Bruce, to to echo what Josh said. I mean, he was Josh is right on there. And also, I do know that the CLDC has a civil case filed on Eric's behalf. Um, I think that ideally, when somebody is wronged to such a grievous level as Eric was wronged in in in, in prison, that there would be some sort of I don't I don't even know if I should say like financial or time served like retribution or like some comeuppance like he sh- but I my understanding is that based on um based on the law it would be v- almost impossible for Eric to benefit in any monetary way from the civil case um I I believe that it, there's a there's a, a a prison act that says that you can't you can't benefit even if you're wronged from um, something that occurs if you set yourself to prison, if you're if you're there. Um, I wish I knew it was, could speak a little bit more articulately. But I think what's really important about this this civil case is that what I what I really think that the CLDC and what Eric's defense team and what I would imagine Eric is is hoping for is that by bringing the civil case, it's going to effectively shine a spotlight on his treatment and and will will be a cautionary tale to any of the psychopaths in the Bureau of Prisons that decide to make the, his remaining time the hardest time in the world. That's not to say that it's not going to happen. I am just always shocked at the level of depravity that people that the Bureau of Prisons will go to to make people uncomfortable on the inside. But having said that, every single night of this case as it went on through the week, Eric was subjected to some new bizarre turned by the Bureau of Prisons, whether all of a sudden he was getting, you know, he went, he was getting yanked out of his, the cell that he'd been in and got transferred to a whole new facility next door. That happened one night, another, another day, his, his cell flooded and coffee was spilled on his documents. Another day, his documents and all of his personal property were, were removed. And that made it almost impossible for him to prep for trial. You know, I mean, it was so bizarre that, that even the, the, the Bureau of Prisons, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, this is nothing funny about this. It's just unreal. The Bureau of Prisons 
uh, story when he had his documents, um, a, a cup of coffee was spilled on his documents and made him impossible to read. And the BOP story was that a bird flew into his cell and knocked this cup of coffee over on his on his documents. And like the, the courtroom, when this was said, was just like jaws <laughs> dropped. And, and the judge who presided over this case, Judge Martinez, he even at that point leaned back in his chair and shook his head and said, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to be able to quote him verbatim, but he's like, basically the gist of what he said was, I cannot believe that what's happening to Mr. King is happening to Mr. King. And the Bureau of Prisons better watch itself because they're setting themselves up for a civil suit, which I don't know if he knew it was already in action, but all of those actions are going to be added to the suit. So hopefully that gives him just the tiniest bit of, bit of cover from from more torture and abuse but it's hard to say yeah i remember seeing see even just like tweets <laughs> about the stupidity of that uh, of that moment unicorn riot had a nice image for their posting of their coverage were there any other highlights that that stood out from the case either testimony from eric or um because he was actually able to speak on his own behalf uh and and had to answer like cross-examination i would imagine but yeah, can you talk about any other elements of how the, the case itself went? Um, sure. Let's see, highlights or lowlights. I guess they're kind of, in a case like this, they're kind of one and the same. It was very interesting to see Lieutenant Wilcox walk into the courtroom for his testimony. Um, on I think that was on day one. You know, all the photographs that I'd seen of Lieutenant Wilcox, he's a fairly large, imposing, hulking figure, and that was not the guy who walked into the courtroom. The guy who walked into the courtroom had a cane, was bent over. Um, evidently, in his off time, he has now since retired from the Bureau of Prisons, probably related to this incident, but uh, he's got a ranch, and I'm not sure exactly if, if he was supposedly or actually injured on his ranch. I'm really not sure. Um, but he walked into the courtroom and sort of shuffled down the center like an old man, and I, I was like, wow, the theatrics just don't, don't stop. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that he wasn't actually injured, but whatever was happening, they made it sure they made, they, they did their very best to make sure that he didn't come in as an imposing hulking prison guard type. He got up on the stand and I would say what was most interesting to me. Um, and I, I mean, I guess this was written and you could have seen it coming from a mile away, but just the, the the government's case was so incredibly weak that any time he was asked a question by uh, the CLDC or by Eric's defense team in any way that could impeach a previous story or a, a previous statement he had made, you know, it was just one, I can't remember, I can't remember, I can't remember after another. And then when the government would come and ask him a similar questions, it was a remarkable how, how quickly his memory sharpened up. So that was really, really interesting. You know, the, the other lieutenant that, that got on the stand, Lieutenant Comrade, his, his testimony was, was really weak. And I think that what was the take home, the important take home of, of that piece was that the government was trying to say, they were really trying to flip it 180 degrees. They were trying to say, Look how authentic our guys are. It's been three years. This uh, you know, three years since this incident. Three or four years since this incident, and you can tell that our guys are telling the truth because there's variation in the story. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that the variation of the story was was widely varied, and it was backed up with with uh, video evidence that the defense team had had brought of uh, that just. Punch so many different holes in the way that this this moment in the broom closet unfolded that it just was absolutely unbelievable. And then you know the inverse of that is when Eric went up on the stand, he told such an incredibly lucid and cohesive story that matched up to every single one of his previous statements. So that was, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, how about you, Josh? What what am I forgetting? I'm, let me give me a second to think about those highlights. No, no, I think you captured them all. I, my partner and I were kind of glued to the phone all week, you know, working and listening to this in the background. But no, I think you captured all the, the major highlights. Eric did a great job while he was on the stand, of course. 
Eric, yeah, Eric did a great job. I, I guess I would also just say, Bursa, that, um, you know, I, I had heard lots of things about Judge Martinez going into this case, and I, I definitely had some concern. I mean, I've got concern anytime I'm in, in the same realm as a federal judge, of course. But um, I have to say that, and of course, my experience as somebody in the gallery watching or, you know, Josh's experience listening, and I know a lot of people had listened, you know, we don't have the same experience that the attorneys do because we're not privy to all the sidebars. And I, I will say that there were more sidebars in this case than I've definitely ever heard of. And I think even Judge Martinez said there were more sidebars and objections in this case than he's ever seen in his career. And so it was very clear to everybody in the courtroom that this was a, uh, it was not only was it a very contentious case like any political case can be, but it was really important to sort of to, to, to find a passage through this story in a way that didn't bias the jury either way. And because this case was political in nature and because Eric chose to do a, a politically mo motivated act of property destruction, there was, it was very tenuous in, in how they would go after Eric. And you could tell that the, the government, the, the U.S. attorneys, were doing everything that they could to open up lines of questioning that were going to shock and dismay jurors who might not, be, who might not have a, the same or even a political analysis as Eric's. And I think that the uh, Eric's defense team did a really skillful job guiding the jury through this story in a way where it didn't open those doors necessarily. You know, you know, there's just lots of different feelings on what 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 the term violence means and whether a politically motivated act of property destruction is violent. And, I, and you know, I I have very strong feelings that it's not, but I think that there was some concern that that the jury could could grab on to certain terminology that would then bias them and they would lose their ability to see this case for what it really was, which is one side is speaking the truth and one side is making up stories as they go along. And so I have to say that not having access to what happened in those sidebars, those I feel like there was a hundred sidebars. I might I'm sure I'm exaggerating, but there were so many that I felt like Judge Martinez did a pretty darn good job running a clean courtroom. You know, I didn't see bias in him. I, I What I saw was a judge that actually just really wanted to follow the letter of the law. And luckily, you know, in this case, the letter of the law is on Eric's side. He was defending himself. And that's a, that's a something, that's a right that every single person has to do in this country, even if you're, even if you're locked up. And so I thought the judge did a pretty good job walking that middle path. And um, I have to say that I think that he was impressed with Eric's defense team. I think that because of the nature of this trial, it would have been very possible to have uh, lawyers that weren't necessarily prepared uh, to handle something at this high level. And I think they hit it out of the park. Yeah, I can see how like bringing up the fact that there are political views that are held by Eric and, and the nature of, of his conviction and pointing to that as as being potentially counter to the political views of the guards and thus motivating them to act in juvenile and petty manners as opposed you know differentiating that from like he burnt down a politician's office and someone could have been hurt like that that's definitely yeah that that seems like a very thin line to walk and it sounds like folks did that very very well do you all have any updates on how Eric's health is these days and how are his spirits? Um, due to the mail ban, not many people have heard from him. I've heard through the grapevine that he is extremely happy about the outcome of the trial. Happy to be getting the few visits that he does, that he is able to get. He's looking forward, I know, to getting everyone's letters and everyone's love. Everyone keeps sending solidarity from around the world. And he's looking forward to you know reading everyone's letters, responding to everyone's letters. You can follow him uh, on social media. Uh, his support site is support eric king.org. And you know, you can send him books now, which is great. 
hopefully if you follow him on social media or check out his website you'll find out when you know when the mail ban is lifted and you can write to him but in the meantime just know that he does appreciate all the support i think he's vocalized that as much as possible to those he has been able to speak to so it's been mentioned that Eric's a pretty prolific poet. You can find a bunch of his poems up on his support website. I don't know if y'all want to share any poetry by Eric that you feel especially moved by. If not, that's totally okay. But I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, yeah, I'll share one. Actually, if you haven't picked up the 2022 Certain Days calendar, Eric wrote a poem uh, for the month of May. So you're still in time to get one. You can go to burningbooks.com. They're only five bucks at this point and all the proceeds benefit political prisoners. But in May, uh, Eric wrote a poem. He actually wrote it to me one time uh, before this calendar came out when we were just thinking of the the theme. It's called Mutual Aid is Friendship. Yeah, it's a great piece. It's very short and it's one of the last ones he was able to send out before one of the ma many male bands he's faced. Well, that's about it for the questions that I had. Uh, are there any other topics that you wanted to talk about? Otherwise, I'd like to, you know, if you could remind folks about, A, how they can support the CLDC, um, the defense work that they do and the research. And we've had guests from CLDC on, on the show a few times to talk about digital security. And we've had um, Lauren Regan on before to talk about that uh, political repression more generally. I'd love to hear more about where to find more about that, as well as Josh has prior been on the show to talk about certain days. So it'd be good to hear about that too. But were there any other topics other than shouting out projects that um, uh, I didn't ask about that y'all want to touch on? I guess, I guess I would just like to throw this in the ring a little bit that I know that supporting political prisoners in this country and around the world is something that I think a very narrow band of, of people who are politically active do. And I just would like to say publicly to anybody who's listening to this, this podcast that it's very, very easy to find resources to support political prisoners in this country. I mean, you can go online and literally Google that, and there's going to be a ton of different places it sends you to. And I just want to encourage people to take 15 or 20 minutes out of their week and, you know, find a different prisoner to write to. I, I think it can't be overstated how potent this act is and not only does it have the potential to change somebody's time on the inside but i also think that it creates bonds that not that can last a lifetime but it's also an incredible way to to build our movement and so i just want to give a rah rah for that um, i think that's something that's really worth people's time and just since i have the i have the air right now if people are interested in supporting the cldc which I think is a really great thing to do. The CLDC, one of the things that I love about working with this organization is the breadth of their work in movement building and resistance and support for activists. It's staggering, you know, really. The CLDC goes to where the work is, whether it be in pipeline work or prisoner support or environmental or animal rights work. It's, it's just a really remarkable organization, and, and anybody can find how to support that at cldc.org. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mirror pretty much everything Mookie said. The CLDC is great. Actually, in two days now, I guess it'll be in the past when people are listening to this, uh, the CLDC is hosting a political prisoner talk with, with Daniel McGowan, with Linda Evans, Ray Luke Lavasser, Rattler, a few other people. I'm sure it'll be amazing like most of the other projects are but also yes just write political prisoners every chance you get you know just try to learn about them eric has really been amazing with that every time he's sent to a new prison he finds friends that he uh you know advocates other people writing too and building relationships and i think it really can be life-changing not only for those inside but for those of us uh, on the outside too I guess besides getting a certain day's calendar, if you can, uh, we're coming up with a theme now for 2023. But if you're heading over to Burning Books to get a calendar, you could get some Oso Blanco greeting cards. Uh, it's a project called Children's Art Project that he and I and a few other people helped start where greeting cards are made with artwork from indigenous political prisoners and the funds benefit the Zapatistas in Chiapas. It's a really cool project. Um, Oso Blanco is a, a fascinating person to get to know. Um, and a shout out to Sean Swain. Hope he's doing all right, even though he's one digit down. 
One digit down, but he's still two fists in the air. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, there, uh, we didn't end up uh, interviewing folks about certain days this year, but there was one that uh, some of y'all participated in on um, Millennials Are Killing Capitalism, I saw. Yeah, yeah, that was Daniel and I a few weeks ago. Uh, that was a, a good one. That's awesome. I'll, I'll link that in the show notes, too. Mookie and Josh, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation and for the work that you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Burst. It was a pleasure. Hey, Burst. Yeah, it was. I, yeah, same, same, Burst. Thank you so much. And Josh, thank you so much for your support for me in this case. You were really instrumental in bringing me along. And uh, I just I'm so grateful for the whole team that came to came together to stand with Eric. It was really a group of outstanding people. And thanks again, Burst. Yes, yeah, thank you. If you would like to support The Final Straw, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow and share our materials online, as well as give us feedback via the links at thsr.wtf slash tree as in link tree. To support our transcription work and wider project, you can subscribe to us via patreon.com slash tfsr. You can also buy some merch or find donation methods at tfsr.wtf slash support. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. In a continuation of the tradition begun by Sean Swain in 2019, naming those killed by police in the so-called U.S. The information was compiled by the website fatalencounters.org. Stephen Ross Glass, Deshaun Latawan Tatum, Stephen Patrick Mosley, Michael Lynn Tucker, James Andrew Eiler. Name withheld by police. April 2nd, Houston, Texas. Name withheld by police. April 2nd, Houston, Texas. Name withheld by police. April 2nd, Waterloo, Iowa. Laura Nicole R. Shebeck. Noah R. Green. Jamal M. Polis Powell. Jasmine Simone Hayes. Duleen Self. Name withheld by police. April 2nd. Florissant, Missouri. That's Zeret LeYehoshua Vierto. Jackie Cameron Caps. Angel Nelson. William Zachary Harvey. Name withheld by police, April 3rd, Vallejo, California. Gabriel Casso. Seth Gibson. Samuel Yeager. Jose Arenas, Dewan Wallace, Jeffrey W. Appelt, James T. Cox, Juan Carlos Estrada, Adam Briggs, Lester Reed, Shamika LaShawn Dantzler, Lawrence M. Thompson, Desmond Montez Ray, Michael Ray Wagner, name withheld by police, April 4th, Newberry, South Carolina. Roy Kenneth Jackal, Jr. Name withheld by police, April 5th, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Danny White, I remember Sycap. Silas Zach Lambert. Name withheld by police, April 6th, Burlingame, California. Devin White Eagle, Koykendall. Stephen Nicole Voiken, Tyler R. Green, Anthony Lewis, Dominique Williams, James Lionel Johnson, James Poppy Alexander, Noah Joseph Ford, Roger Cornelius Allen, Donald Van Buren Turner, Charles Cavell Green, Raheem Reeder, Page Pierce. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Katerius Gerard Minor. Kevin Jones. Gabriel Munoz Jr. Tashund Andrea Tanner. Douglas C. Bart. David William Dieterman. Name withheld by police, April 10th. Riverside, California. Guillermo Nemo Amezqua. Russell Cruz. Joshua Michael Johnson. 
Rescue Aram, Faustine Guatigo, Joshua Alexander Mitchell, Royce Trace Dale Lillard III, Dante Demetrius Wright, name withheld by police, April 11th, Fort Gibson, Oklahoma, name withheld by police, April 11th, Jasper, Alabama, Matthew Zadok Williams, Peter Alexander Shelton, Miles Jackson, Angelina Sue Rod, Silas Smith, Blaine Peterson, Freddie Holmes Jr., Anthony J. Thompson Jr., Peyton Ham, Cameron P. M. Polinitz, Keith Robert Tafoya, Matthew Lee Walker, Thomas Andrew Bond, Christopher Templo Marquez, Raymond Quintana, Stephen B. Swears, Lindani Miani, Marcelo Garcia. Name withheld by police, April 14th, Meridian, Idaho. Alyssa Roman, Jacob Jake Wood, Erica Miller, Henry Porter, Jeffrey Guy Sachs. Name withheld by police, April 15th, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Jeffrey Lilja, Roger Fuentes, O.J. Cummings, Victor Ivan Barron, Jim Gomez, Oliver Seven Frazier Savoy, Inslee Jr., Roderick Inge, Christopher Andrew Mora. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Juan James Cordova, Alex Anthony Garcia, Fanny Joe Barbosa, Robert Douglas Delgado, Bradley Michael Rose, Smokey Lynn Crockett, Alex LeVon Hayes, Malik Ali Malik, Adam A. Grischuk, Matthew Harry, Larry Jenkins, David Kalashima, Dequan Cortez Glenn, Ryan O'Neill Williams, name withheld by police, April 18th, East Point, Michigan, Bradley Michael Olson, Donnie Morris Buffs Jr., Jose Flores, Howard Celine Baker, Robert Paul Garcia, Antonio Cantu, Mario Arenales Gonzalez, Edgar Luis Torado, Brian De Leon, name withheld by police, Lakewood, Colorado, name withheld by police, Detroit, Michigan, name withheld by police, Detroit, Michigan. Terry Wayne Bishop, Makia Bryant, Brandon Lewis LeMay Sr., Philip Galvan Vong, Stephen John Olson, Andrew Brown Jr. Name withheld by police, April 21st, Tocqueville, Utah. Shinea Jones, Corey M. Orsanico, John Adams, Jeffrey Adams, name withheld by police, April 22nd, Denver, Colorado, Richard Lee Quintana, Tori Casey, Edward Robison, name withheld by police, April 23rd, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, name withheld by police, April 23rd, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Michael Lee McClure, Name withheld by police, April 23rd, Warren Park, Indiana. Richard Salitro, Benjamin Ridley, Jacoby Jean Wilcox, Marvin A. Vaiga Jr., Dan Keene, James David Mathis, Raymond N. Daniel Jackson, Pedro Carbajal, Michael Henry Miller, 
William Johnson Jr. Lisa Arsenal, Robin Naftel Herring, Precious Nievas, Philip Nievas, Carlos Lopez Melendez, Llewellyn R. Gill, name withheld by police, April 27th, Houston, Texas, Asia Marie Boatwright, Ryan Davis, Oscar Herrera, Dalton James Garrett Coyman, Soraya Shepherds, Kiner Jean Rollins, Barry K. Stewart, Robert A. Sanders, Lyndon Williams, Isaac Alton Barnes, Alfredo Aceves, name withheld by police, April 29th, Hayward, California, name withheld by police, April 29th, Sterling Heights, Michigan. Joe Earl Robido, Everett Orrit Brown, Brian Lee Paz, Jason Michael Pinion, Alexis Brianna Wilson, Catherine Winnegar, Torrance Maurice Parker. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five you can find his past writings updates on his case here's past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org Psst. you can cash app dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send Dota us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at at Swainiac 1969 or Twitter at at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.